my name is Sam Wong. I'm from the admissions office, and I am one of those people who have been around for some time, and I have read a lot of different applications. So I'm going to share with you everything I know about completing a good application, you know, a complete application. Um, so that hopefully when you start your application with HABU or elsewhere, it will st still be useful. But before I start, I want to do some housekeeping. First of all, this session is tailor-made for international students. So while some of the information would apply to Hong Kong ID card holder or Chinese passport holder, this is not tailor-made for what we call local student or non-local student who are like Chinese applicants. So if you are in that category and you would like to apply and if you have questions, I strongly encourage you to contact our non-local team, okay? But for those of you who are not Chinese or Hong Kong passport holders, that you are studying abroad or you are from overseas outside of Hong Kong and you're interested in coming to HABU, this is a session for you. I assume that all of you are here because you are interested in our university, but still I want to give you a very quick review, like um, an overview of what we offer here at HABU. So if you have done your research, you will know that we have actually a pretty small student population. We only have around 7,300 students, but we have 730 teaching staff and faculty. That is why it is a welcoming and supportive community. And I think this is really what we are proud of. We are found, We were founded by the Baptist Convention in 1956. That is why the name, but there is no religious requirement. We open our door to everybody. In Hong Kong, both Chinese and English are official languages. And at HABU, English is the medium of instructions. Out of 48 majors, only three of them require some kind of Chinese proficiency. Other than that, 45 of them are taught in English. That's why we ask for English proficiency requirement and proof. And I will explain that later. So we have over 40 different majors and they, they are, you know, across different disciplines. And I'll go further after this slide. In terms of opportunities, we have research, student exchange, internship available to international students. On-campus accommodation is available and we are building a new one. We are very excited. Student visa holders are actually um, allowed to take a part-time job during the semester on campus and full-time outside of the campus during the summer. And many students will take advantage of that and take up internship, which will make them more competitive in the job market later on. And we talk about the job markets because international students are allowed to apply for a visa extension that could go up to two years after graduation. So you can stay in Hong Kong and look for jobs. And if you get a job, then your employers will help you to get a work visa that will allow you to work and stay in Hong Kong legally. And if you stay in Hong Kong continuously for seven years, then you can go ahead and apply for permanent residency. So that's the whole journey ahead. And this is all of this reason why international students are looking at Hong Kong or HABU. Now let's move on to the theme of today, how to do an application, what do we do? So I have split it up into few stage. First, before you do the application, pre-application stage, what do you need to do? You need to identify the programs that you are interested in. And to do that, I want to go to the our website with you together with you. Now, uh, there's something very special about us uh, at HABU. We have seven faculties and schools, and those you see on screen highlighted in green, they adopt what we call broad-based admission. Meaning when you apply, you don't have to choose a major. And in your first year, you can take subjects from different concentrations or majors before you choose one or two for some faculty uh, that you would like to focus on. And I want to show you how to do that by looking at our website. Now, when you go to our website, this is what you see. And I will also copy that. Well, I assume that all of you have been to our website, but then I still want to 
show everybody in case you want to do that together. Then there it is. So this is our website. If you scroll down, then you will see programs on offer. These are all the programs available to international students. For example, you are interested in business. You just go to BBA, Business Concern, uh, Bachelor of Best Business Administration. You click inside and there will be a special page that is about BBA. And you can see different majors here, all seven of them. So if you are interested in finance, for instance, then you will see that it's one of the majors under BBA, then you should apply to BBA instead of finance. Because if you are a final year high school student, then you are only eligible for year one admissions. So do not go for year three admissions only because you cannot find finance on the application, okay? Similarly, science is the same. So we go to science, faculty of science. Whoever is interested in Computer science, say, it is right here under Bachelor of Science. So if you're interested in computer science, you should apply to Bachelor of Science year one, not Bachelor of, not year three in computer science, okay? So first figure out what programs you should be applying to. Which one do you really like? And may I take this opportunity to remind everyone, especially those who said they want to study computer science, please try to open up. I mean, most of the students I talked to who said they want to do computer science, they don't really know what computer science is about. They just have an idea, I like coding or I'm interested in tagging problem, but there are just so many different programs that could allow you to develop such skills that might interest you even more or, or might be more beneficial to your future. So instead of just jumping into, oh, for, you know, computer science, that's it, nothing more, go through the list of programs that we are offering. For example, visual art students, you know, design students, oh, you don't have design, you don't have the word design. So I cannot apply to this school. Really? Oh, where is it? Oh. I accidentally shut down my window. Okay, there you go. Let's go back to visual arts. So for example, those who are interested in design, maybe you should look at our visual arts because in our visual arts, we have uh, craft and design and also studio arts. So you can find different kinds of art from here. But at the same time, you should be looking at arts and technology as well, because that might be the future if you have heard of immersive arts. So you may want to really open up and go through the list instead of rushing into, oh, computer science, that's it, just apply to computer science. Okay, maybe that should be what you are looking at. Now, after you identify the right programs, you may need to figure out which is your first choice and which is your second choice. So every applicant gets to choose two programs. And your first choice is really the program that you want to get into. And you will only be considered by your second choice if you are rejected by your first choice, okay? Your applications will not be considered by both first choice and second choice at the same time. It doesn't work that way, not here. So you have to think very carefully which is the program you really, really want to get into. Because once you submit your application, you cannot change your program choice. That's one thing. And secondly, you have to pay attention to which programs do not accept second choice. And let me show you. It could be found on the program page. So I hope you are still with me. I'm going back to BBA because business is one of the programs that does not consider second choice. So if they don't, it will be set at the end of the list. You see it here in the remarks that it does not, will not consider second choice applicants. It means that if you put them in your second choice, so if you got rejected by your first choice, maybe it's science, 
and then it goes to your second choice, which is business. They will reject you right away because they said so. They do not consider the second choice. So pay attention to those that might not consider the second choice because if you do, then in theory, you don't have a second choice. You just waste that slot, okay? So pay attention to that. So you figure out what you really want, which is your first choice and what is your second choice, what's next? You have to find out whether you meet the qualification, the requirements. So we have two uh, sets of requirements. You have to meet the entrance requirements and the English language requirements. And for most programs, they share the same entrance requirements. So let me show you how to find the entrance requirement. We go back to the website. If you scroll down, then you see the admissions requirement. And usually, the standard student, not the brilliant one, the standard student will look at this page and go, oh, so I must take SAT. And that is a, a, a sim symptom of like standard student who doesn't read. You see, this is international curricula, the common ones that, that many students take around the world. So yes, we accept SAT, but we also accept Australian curriculum, British, Canadian, and so on. And then we have a wide list of local curriculum. For example, if you are from, say, Bangladesh, we actually accept your higher secondary certificate as well. So look through the list to see if we accept your local qualifications in terms of, you know, the university entrance requirement. And for English requirements, the same. We have a list. So, of course, we accept the usual total IELTS, but then we also accept SAT, 590, or GCO level, IGCSE, or even some local curriculum, Cameroon GCEA level, or Malaysia curriculum, and so on. So do study the list carefully, okay? There are a very a handful of programs that has particular requirements, usually under creative arts. So for example, for our music program, you will see at the bottom program entrance requirements. So our music programs will ask for ABRSM result uh, in theory or in practical. So you might want to check out. And to be honest, like if you are to apply to a program, you should study the, the, the individual web page of the individual program thoroughly before you really proceed to making the application. I mean, after all, this is a big decision, right? You don't want to rush into something that you might not want and you don't want to risk, you know, wasting your, your application fee. So read, study carefully the requirements, make sure you meet the requirements and then you want to prepare for the required documents, which is you know, often the questions. So what do we need? For final year high school students, if you are still, you know, you are in the final year, you're going to finish your last exam and then graduating maybe next month or next May, then this is what you should be preparing. So the star one, the first two are the required documents. You must have either your passport copy or if you don't have your passport yet, you can submit a copy of your national ID card to prove that you are an international student, that you are not a Hong Kong ID card holder or Chinese passport holder, because some of the admissions policy, for example, allocation of scholarships are applicable to international students only. So you want to make sure that you prove that to the panel, to the admissions office, okay? Secondly, we need your latest transfer for sure. And when it comes to the latest, if you are in grade, grade 12, then usually the schools will provide um, your grade 11 transcript. And if you apply later, maybe you already have your term one, grade 12 term one uh, transcript. 
that would help. Some schools also provide grade 9 or grade 10 transcript, no problem. Uh, if your school doesn't provide that, it's fine. We are asking for latest transcript, so it has to be the latest one. Okay, and if the faculty uh, would like to have more information, they can always reach out to you. So don't worry about it. So we need your latest transcript and then your predicted grades. So for IB students, this is required. That, that is not optional. You must give us the predicted grades. If they are confidential to you, as well as other documents, your teachers can send them to us directly, but it's required. We cannot proceed without the predicted grades. For A-level students, most of the schools will provide predicted grades. It would be great if you can provide that to us, if you can include that in your application, that would definitely help the faculty get where you are coming from. But if your school does not provide pred predicted grades, that's fine. And for the rest, uh, usually there won't be. Or sometimes for class lessons, uh, some school, they will have like a predicted grade for the national exam, sometimes not for all the school. If it's available, then it's great. Just go ahead and provide that. If not, it's fine. Okay. So there, there goes the predicted grades. And then there is the English test results. Now I have shown you just now on our website that we accept a wide range of qualifications in terms of English proficiency. Maybe you plan to fulfill that with your O level result. If that's the if that is the case, then just, just upload your O level results. Or if you plan to take IELTS, but you haven't got the result yet, just put down the, the test days, the days that you have signed up for test on the application. It's fine that it's not available yet at the time when you apply. You can submit that later, okay? Um, that's just it. I mean, it. but then you do have to have a plan to fulfill the English proficiency uh, requirements because that's part of you know, meeting the minimum requirements. So you must have a plan. You can't say that, oh, well, do I have a, do I need that? Oh, I don't know yet. No, that is not, that is not acceptable. You need to know how do you plan to do it. If you plan to take an IELTS test, but for some reason in your country, you cannot sign up for it yet, then you can also explain to us. Okay, so that is the English test result. And then there it comes the personal statement and recommendation letter. Now they are both optional. And when we say optional, we mean it. It's not a fake optional. If you do not have a story to tell, it's fine that you don't submit a personal statement. I would think if you have a story to tell, if you have an aspiration, if you really have something you want to share with the admission panel or the, or the professors, do go ahead. But if you don't, don't force yourself into writing some kind of fiction. I sometimes see students forcing themselves into writing 300 words. That is so far from anything that they mean to. And it really, it doesn't help. It could backfire. And trust me, our professors read those personal statements. And in many cases, they ask questions from quoting from the personal statement. So, be me if if you mean it, go ahead. If you don't, then forget about it. Okay. Same for recommendations. If you have a teacher who will really want to support you and want to write you a good recommendation that is related to your application here, go ahead. If not, don't ask your auntie or your uncle to write a statement about how good a kid you are. You might be laughing, but you know we have seen different things over the years, and you'd be surprised. So um. Wherever documents that you want to include, and now we come to the last point, any other supporting documents, my suggestion is look at the relevancy. Does, is it relevant to your application? How is it going to be of an advantage to your application? And also the presentation matters. So let me give you an example. One year, uh, we come across an application and in the attachment, there are many attachments. First, first there are what 30 something attachments and all of the file names are random numbers. So there is no meaning to those files at all, like scan 5423421A, B. Uh, so we can't tell from the file name. So we have to download them all. And then many of them, when we open the files, many of them are actually photos of medals. 
So these students obviously are very, they must be very good at sports, I believe, judging from the design of the medal. But they did not give us any explanation, whatnot. They just took photo of the those medals. So that's not much we can get out from those documents. So when I say presentation matters, if you have uh, some experience or achievements you want to share, I would suggest that you can put that in the form of a CV or resume. If you don't know what that is, Google CV, okay? You may put your experience in a form of CV and that will help, that's one. And secondly, many students would think, oh, what kind of activities should I take? What kind of things that I should include? in my application. Um, in my opinion, my suggestion is participation is the lowest level. So you can tell us you have joined like 300 different events, you know, you upload 300 different certificate of participation without explanation. That's the lowest form. And the second level is achievement. Just a, a, a certificate saying championship of some kind of comp competition. Again, no, other uh, information about the, the program or the competition, how many people were joining, when was that, what was that? That would be the second level. And the third one would be explaining your experience. For example, you join a competition with three of your friends, uh, a robotic competition, you were the leader. You didn't win, your team didn't win, but then you learn to become a better leader, you have uh, build your interpersonal skills and throughout the process, you feel like, you know, you, you recognize your aspiration to be uh, a scientist in that area or a researcher in that area. That, if you ask me, would be even better than submitting just like 300 different certificates of particip participation or some kind of activities that we might not understand. And of course, at the end of the day, you see this small remarks at the bottom, it should not be that small, but because it, it's important. If you are providing any documents that are not written in English, please translate them. So if they are academic documents, for example, your transcript, your uh, national exam results, then they should be notarized, meaning either you get someone to notarize it, or you can have your school verify it by putting a stamp on it, okay? But if it's just a participation certificate of some local events or competition, you might want to do the translation on the side on your own. Uh, and then if anyone, if the faculties want to know more or ask for more official documents, they will go to you. They will ask you to provide that. All right. So make sure you do that. So this is for the final year high school students. What about those who have graduated? similar. You need your passport copy or copy of your national ID. You should have your high school graduation diploma or anything that proves that you have graduated from high school. You might have your exam results, either a public exam, a national exam, or SAT, whatever. You should have some of that. And if you are currently studying at any post-secondary institution, please provide information. Do not shy away from that. So actually, when you when you start the application, it will uh, there is a declaration that says everything you provide has to be correct and true, and we will ask you if you are studying any post secondary institution, please be honest about it. I don't know why for some reason students keep it away from us, and trust me, it's not a good thing when we find out that you know you're actually studying in in certain institution. And then we will definitely ask you for further information. So if you are currently studying at any post-secondary institution or you have done so, please make sure that you provide information which should include, say, your latest transfer from that uh, post-secondary institution, a graduation cert from that institution, or an enrollment record of that institution, okay? If there is any problem for you to provide such information, let us know. Do not shy away from it. Just say that, you know, I have done this and that, but for some reason the school has closed down or whatnot, I cannot get information. What should I do? Contact us, let us know, okay? Just be very honest about 
about what you are going through. All right. And same thing for the high school students, same English test result. If you have it, upload that. If you don't have it now, upload that later. Same for personal statement uh, and recommendation letter. Uh, but for students who are taking a gap year, for instance, I do recommend that you write a same personal statement, maybe a simple one, or maybe a CV at least to explain what you have gone through, like what is going on, what you have planned for yourself in this gap year, or um, what was the idea to take a, a gap year, because the faculty will be curious and that will help them to understand where you're coming from. Um, and again, if those documents that you are uploading, providing are not in English, then make sure that you provide English translation. That will be the same. Okay. All right. I see a few students. Uh, you know what? I will answer questions at the end. Let's move on first because we have a lot to cover. So moving on, start the application. Now, I don't know how many of you have start the application but let's do it together. First thing first, this is an online application. And I don't know about you, I think, you know, these days in 2023, uh, wherever we jump into, go to a website, we, we, we see sign in or sign up, we will just jump to sign up. We don't read the words at all, but that is not the right way to do. So when you come to this page, where you open the application, and I will also post it here, wherever you come to this page, please, please read the instruction. Read this page, all those important notes, read the guidelines. You know, I have students coming to me urgently last week saying that, when is the when is the early round deadline? Please, please tell me. It's urgent. And I'm like, it's on the website. Like, and you wrote to me at 9 p.m. on Saturday. What do you expect? This is just not efficient. I mean, as much as I wish to help. When I came back on Monday, it's already over. So information is online. Read them. Read instruction. Follow instruction is a very important skill. That would make you stand out from the crowd, trust me. So read guidelines and then read the demo. We actually do a very hand-holding step-by-step guide on every single question, how you should answer them. If you have studied this, you will find this webinar boring. So do that for me and for you. You know, this is an important decision again, do that, okay? Now, after you have done all this, and you're ready to sign up. Then you will have to, you will come into this page. Make sure you are applying to the right scheme. So for you guys, international students, you are applying to the first one, government funded programs, direct non jupas In fact, the second one is for like exceptional talent. It's not something that we promote and it shouldn't be the case that, you know, but still there are students who will misunderstood and choose that. So make sure that you choose the first one and then you will have to come up with a username and you have to come up with a password. Now, please find a place, a safe place to mark it down because we won't remember. And I, we still have, every year, we still have students coming to us and say, I forgot my username, I forgot my password. And then they open like five different accounts just because of that. So don't do that. And then when it comes to email, that's I have a, 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 a tips or advice. Many of you will use your school emails, which is fine. But then some of you, uh, your school email will be deactivated once you graduate. And some of you graduate in December. So some students could not get email after December or they forgot to forward their emails to their other email accounts after that. And they just stopped receiving emails from us. So make sure that you use an email account that is yours and you are laughing as well, right? Of course it's yours. Well, uh, we have students who use like my brother's email, so I can't check it because I don't know the password. Uh, don't do that. Open an email account for yourself and also make sure that this is an email account that you will actually check frequently, okay? After you have done so, then you will get an email at um, 
from the system and that asks you to activate your account. And after you activate your account, you'll be able to log in. So this is my um, application, okay? Now, the first thing you have to choose is programs. So that's why at the beginning of this webinar, I said, let's try first figure out which year and program you are applying to. If you are final year students in high school, or if you have just graduated from high school, or if you are intended to apply to year one admissions, then it should be year one. And then you can find all the programs here. So let's go for year one. And then maybe I will choose, oh, I have to save. Yes, this is a very safe system. So I should save and then I should save and then I will move on to choosing the program. So I want to choose my, I love arts. So I will choose visual arts as my first choice and I will save. And I want to add a second choice, which should be BBA, no add, because BBA does not consider second choice. We talk about that, so no. Okay, second choice, maybe arts. I love writing, so I would choose arts. So you see that for our visual arts, students are required to submit portfolio. We will talk about that later. There are certain programs that ask for portfolio, and usually you are not required to submit that at the time of application. You'll be invited to submit them separately through, through a different platform, but not here. So don't worry about it here. Okay, I have chosen visual arts and then arts for my program. I will save and then I will move on. So make sure that this is what you want. Can I move on, save and move on? Oops, move on, next. Okay. Next, so this is the page when you feel personal particulars. How difficult is that, right? Of course, you know your name. Well, let's put it this way. Sometimes we don't. When we say we ask for your surname, surname is your family name, given name is your first name, and it should be the same as it's shown on your passport. Anything that is not included in your passport should not be up here. Okay, and the sequence should be the same as well. So go to your passport, look at the, the page with your photo, and then look at the bottom. You will see how your family name and given name or first name is being shown. Okay, follow that. For Chinese name, please do not put down the Google Translate of your Chinese name. Only if you have your Chinese name shown on your passport that you should put on it. But in fact, if you are an international student, it's very rare, almost not possible to have a Chinese name on your passport. So it should be blank for most students, okay? Are you a local student? It should be no for this webinar, because I said at the beginning, this is a tailor mix session for international students, which means non-local, non-Hong Kong ID and non-Chinese passport holder. Okay, so if you choose non-local, then you'll be able to choose your nationality and then you'll be able to input your, uh, uh, your passport number. If you don't have a passport yet, just put down a dummy number, which is so dummy that we know exactly that is a, um, a fake number, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, epnet, and then upload your national ID copy so that you can submit your application. Otherwise, you cannot go through, okay? And date of birth, gender, address, no problem. Currently studying or residing overseas? Yes or no, it depends because some of you are maybe in international school, so it's, it's your decision. Uh, for the phone number, please provide a number that allow us to reach you. I don't know why every year I still have problem trying to reach out to students when I follow that numbers. It's really, they, they, I don't know why, it just, it's, it's, it just doesn't work. So please do that. And then are you a Chinese speaking uh, applicant? Again, if you love Chinese TV drama and learn some Chinese, that doesn't qualify you as a Chinese speaking applicant. So I met too many. Um, here, I, I think we are referring to those whose mother tongue is Chinese or who study A-level Chinese, IBI uh, Chinese, or have taken HSK Chinese tests. Okay. Um, Africans with disability, qualification outside Hong Kong, yes. If you are international students 
studying abroad? And if you choose yes, now, what country of the qualification obtained? This is a tricky question. So if you are an A-level student and you are studying in Bangladesh, then Bangladesh should be where you obtain your qualification, not UK, okay? Even though you are studying GCE, okay? So I hope I give you a good idea of what you should be doing here. Moving on, highest qualification. It should be easy. So for those who are doing A level, IB, you know, you, you find the usual suspect here. If you are taking local qualification, for example, uh, the West African third or the Vietnamese um, curriculum, just choose other regional national curriculum. If you are studying in um, degree program, but have not finished, then go for non-final year undergraduate students. Oh, one thing, many students who are in IB diploma thought themselves, you know, consider themselves as higher diploma program. No, that's not true. Go for IB diploma. It's, it's spelling it, you know, IB diploma. That's where you should go. And for those of you who are studying in A-level school, in some country, you, you know, you go to secondary school and then you go to another school for A-level, that is still part of your secondary education. That's not post-secondary. So, do not go further down to associate degree, diploma, whatnot, okay? It's still secondary. And that comes to the qualification part, which is also always a problem. So many students would thought that they are in post-secondary education, but you are not. You are still in part of higher education. But no, no, I mean secondary education. You are still in high school. So, and if you are not sure how many years you have done in primary education, how many years you have done in secondary education, Ask your teacher or Google. I mean, it's find a few more sources. Like, I, I mean, you should know how many years you have studied, but if you are in doubt, then try to find the information online, okay? And as I said, if you are in your final year in high school, doing your A2 in A-level, your DP2 is still part of your secondary education, not your post-secondary post education, okay? Don't go there. And for other academic professional qualifications, they are actually mostly for those who are studying social work as a mature student. So it's not applicable for most of you. So just skip that part, okay? Just skip it. Moving on, examination results. I want to use A-level and IB as, as an example because it's very common. So let's go to GCE. Uh, for A-level students, so just choose what you have done. If you have done A AS, O-level, IL, go for it and put it down here. If you don't have the result yet, as we say here, just input the year of attempt and subject taken and leave the field grade blank, okay? And for IB, you probably will not have your final result yet, which is natural. Everybody is the same unless you have graduated from high school. But do uh, put down your personal code and your school code. If you don't have it, for some reason you don't have it yet, write to us and explain why. So there are some schools that are actually in the process of registering students and the teacher will send us an email to explain or the student will send us an email to explain. But if you don't explain, then we will always consider your application to be incomplete because as I mentioned earlier, predictor grades is compulsory for IB applicants, okay? And then what else? English language qualification. So if you have taken the test, do so, put down your grade, your score, but if not, just put down the month and the day that you plan to take the test, okay? No worries, you can always submit your English test result later. Additional information. Now, whatever you want to put here uh, under work experience, be ready to provide proof. Um, it's not, I mean, sometimes the faculty ask for it, but I mean, it's really a, an honor system here. So again, try to filter out your, you know, think about whether this is the worst mentioning work experience. If you have uh, work at a cashier as a summer job at your uncle's kiosk, I, I'm not sure if that is something that is worth mentioning. But if you have graduated from high school for five years and in, you know, in, in between you have worked for three years or four years, then you may want to mention that, you know, explain where you're coming from, what you have gone through, okay? Um, 
for personal statement, again, it's an optional uh, a document. You may either type your content here or you can simply upload a separate documents under supporting documents. Either way will do is not a good, better or worse um, scenario. So don't be too stubborn with how you submit. It's more important what you submit. And when it comes to referee information, again, it's optional. Now, if you have identified one or two teachers or persons who want to be your reference, who would want to write you a reference, um, you can either provide that information here and they will receive an invitation to submit reference letter from the system once you submit the application. Or if they have already prepared let a letter for you, then and they are ready to pass the letter to you that is not confidential to you, you can simply upload them. Either this or that. Either provide information here and allow the system to invite them, or you can upload the documents under the supporting documents. Don't do both, okay? It's not necessary to do both, okay? And it again, it doesn't matter how. I don't know, some students are so nervous, like they were like, is it better if I provide the email address and let them submit it on their own? It really doesn't matter at the end of the day, you know, as long as it's a genuine one and a, and a good reference, that's all it matters, okay? Um, so this is the additional information and last but not least, supporting documents. Now, I know many of you, you know, they so many things to take care of and, and this is filling in form is not your expertise, but please let me give you the these tips. File names matter. Name your file in a meaningful way. It would definitely help us to process your application faster. And it helps you as well. I mean, how do you know what is what when it's all scared? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, I can't work that way. So name your files in a meaningful way. Upload documents that is related to the information that you have provided. For example, you have mentioned that you have A in GCE O-level English, then provide your O-level results. If you have already done your IELTS, then submit your, upload your IELTS results. Um, if you have done SAT, then upload your SAT results, or you can ask College Board to send them to me, to us, but it's always good to just first upload a screen cap so that we have something to look at first. Um, if it's, again, if it's confidential to you, if your school said, no, we cannot pass it on to you, our predicted grades are confidential to students, no problem, just let your teachers send them to us. The only thing, one thing that is completely non-negotiable that must be uploaded before you submit the application is your passport copy or a copy of your national ID. This is a system setup. If you don't upload that, you cannot submit an application. This is a, a fact, okay? So you have to do that, that's for sure. If you don't have your transcript, then we will not proceed to process your application, but you can submit an application. So make sure you have that. Um, Let's face it, please try to submit everything you have, because if you don't, then we will spend time chasing you, and then wherever you submit an application doesn't mean that we will process it because it's not complete. And that brings me to completing submitting an application. So tips, proofread, proofread, proofread. It's silly, it sounds silly, but Really, I have students who spell their names wrong. I have students who spell their school names wrong. And also, also please do not use abbreviation, like name of school, BCPDPDE -E, campus. What is that? What is that? No one know what is that? I know it's a famous school in your region, but you are applying to a, an overseas institution, help us to understand where you're coming from, okay? Spell out everything, check everything, make sure that is correct. Not just your personal statement. I have students spend two months working on the personal statement and spell everything else wrong. Even English, the subject name is wrong. Like, it's not worth it, okay? That's one thing. No separate application for scholarship. So don't look for it. There is no separate application. Competitive uh, candidates will be considered automatically, okay? You don't have to apply separately. 
And then I mentioned before, and I'll say it again, program choices cannot be changed after submission. So do not, you know, do not just submit and then come back to us and say, oh, can I change my second choice or first choice? No, it's not possible. Do not do that. Think very carefully, thoroughly, talk to your teachers, with your parents, talk to yourself. Do I really want this before you click submission? Okay. And you'll be happy to know that you can add documents after submission. So if you are still working on your personal statement or if your teacher is working in your transcript, but you, for some reason you want to submit first, you can do that and submit the supporting documents later. I don't strongly encourage that, but if that is the case, well, you still have some buffer, maybe one or two weeks. Uh, my suggestion is, submit all the documents that you want to be included in the application by your interview days, the latest, because if you submit anything after the interview, you know, that's pretty much the day when the professors get to know you and decide whether they want, they look at your application and decide whether they want to give you an admission or a scholarship. So you want to do that before it. Um, so those are tips and advice. So, if when you are ready, you submit your application and after submission, if your application is complete, meaning that we see or you know all the information is correct, we have all the information that we want to know about you. Uh, we have your passport copy, your latest transcript, your predicted grade five B students, we have your O level cert if you that's what you were you have written or whatnot, we will consider that. A complete application. We will review that and then we find the, those who meet the minimum entrance requirement, we will pass it on to the faculty and they will shortlist students for interview. So most of our programs interview students, especially if you're being considered for scholarship, then there will be interview. And the interviews are always to be done online. You don't have to fly to Hong Kong. It's always hosted by the chair by the professors themselves so they are really the your teachers you know their future teachers so they will find out where you're coming from uh i actually don't know we don't know the questions they, that they asked from but from the tips from our former students or our current students uh in many cases they will draw questions from your personal statements they will ask you why do you choose this particular majors these programs from this university in this city and it can't be because my parents told me to, or my teachers told me to, or actually, I don't know. I just want to give it a shot. Like that might not be the best answer. So if you are not sure what to do with interview, you can go to our YouTube channel because we have done a webinar on teaching students how to prepare themselves as competitive candidate by our scholarship students. So go watch that. Um, but do be prepared for interview. And in many cases, the interview is a critical, very essential and critical part in the evaluation process. So do try to do your best in that, okay? And what happened if your application is successful? So if your application is successful, congratulations, you will receive an offer from us via email. And then you will given around two weeks time to settle the payment for admission to confirm to secure your spot. Uh, and there would be a deadline to do so, usually two weeks, especially if you are given a scholarship, then you will be given around two weeks to confirm the offer, to accept the offer. And once you accept the offer, we will uh, assist you with the student visa process. So the university will be your sponsor. And then we will send you instruction on how to pre prepare for your uh, student visa application. We will also uh, provide necessary documents to the immigration. And we will start the process actually quite early, usually in March. Or we are actually considering whether we can do it earlier this year so that students can get the visa on time. Probably you can start preparing for your journey to Hong Kong earlier. And usually from spring, spring onwards, we will have... Uh, online events that is designed for freshmen, for uh, first year students, so that you can work on your transition, prepare your journey, and meet with the faculty members and so on. And this is the end of my presentation. Uh, we are from the admissions office. And again, this is a smaller university, so we are ready to help 
every single one of you. In fact, once you start an application, we will be alerted and we will reach out to you. We will send you some essential tips and advice, and we will also look at your application and tell you if, if something goes wrong. Okay, now I am open for application now. I will go and read all the questions. Let's see, what do we have? We have, okay. Everybody knows how to use Q&A, which is great. Gap year student, good evening. Difference between a portfolio and sharing our achievements. Okay, portfolio usually is uh, a special term for students who are applying to creative arts degrees. So for example, our visual arts, arts and technology, and our BBA in global entertainment, they ask for portfolio and they have specific guidelines on that. And for just any students applying to other majors who want to share their achievements, usually they are not called portfolio. But I think for this DAWA, I think you are interested in art. So you are asking about portfolio and it should be on our website that there is the visual arts webpage where they will have a guideline on portfolio. Right, assessment details required. Right, so if you, let me, okay, let me share the screen again. And this is, I mean, this, I, I don't remember everything. It's just what we do. So if you are, say, you're interested in visual arts, you just go to the website, and I do that every day, all the time. Go to the website and then look for visual arts because all the details will be on the web page of the individual program. So visual arts, and then if I scroll down, then it will say, I require to submit portfolio for assessment, la la la, and then details are here, and then you can go and read the details. Okay, all right, this is done. IL student has that my, I give them so much. Mm -hmm. Apply, so like, okay, the question is, I have given my math exam and have the final result for it but my thesis and chemistry, I gave those in October. So my results are pending and are due in January. So like while I'm studying, while I'm applying, should I apply with my A-level math and predict degree in physical, physics and chem? Or should I apply with predicted grades for three, all three subjects provided or, it doesn't matter. Now, this is very typical. Um, just submit what you have on hand. If you already have your math exam result, just submit that. Provide facts. You already have grade what in math input and then physics and chem to be con confirmed and then provide predicted grade. It doesn't matter. We have applicants from around the world. It's natural that every single student have different um, situations. So it's fine. You know, you're not disadvantage because you present it in different way. Just be honest about your situation. Okay, music qualification. So for music, go to the page for music and then study what they ask for because music has special program requirements. Internationals are allowed to take the college board AP exam in our home country on the same days as in the US. What's HABU's policy on giving advanced standing credit for first year UG students upon submission of relevant AP score? So if we're talking about um, exemption, credit exemption or credit transfer, we do uh, offer that possibilities for IB student A-level and AP student as well, but we do not do the evaluation at the time of application. That is to be applied by first year students after they enrolled, they are enrolled in the university. Then they can submit to individual departments on like, can you examine me for that? And I believe there are two ways to do, I mean, it could be an exemption, meaning you don't have to take these subjects, but you can use the credit somewhere else, or it could be a credit transfer but we cannot tell at the time of application, that is true. So that would be a slightly different from the practice in US and Canada. Okay, other question, let's see. This has been done explicit. Okay, scholarship requirements, right. For IAL, okay, scholarship requirement, let's see. 
let me go back to that. I, I want to see if we have other. I would like to nominate students. Okay, counselors are, there are counselors asking about nomination scheme. So for, so our nomination scheme is exclusive to a handful of schools. If you are interested and you have not received an invitation and you are interested and you want to reach out, please email us and we will try to have a conversation to see whether it is a good match and see if it is at all possible. Okay, please email us. Okay, more scholarship questions. I will answer that later. Okay, scholarship. Can students 16 years of age get a student visa to Hong Kong? I don't think we have 16 year old before, but we have 17 year old. But indeed, there is no. Um, I would I, I would imagine that is the same because seventeen is also minor. So what happened is we will have the uh, guardian to write a statement concerning you know, uh, that they they will be financed and uh also for the minors they the university will be their guardian, their official guardian before they turn eighteen. But if I remember right, I think the youngest one we had in the past five years maybe, or maybe even eight, is 17. So we will have to look into that. That is that is a good question. Or maybe when they arrive, they are already 17. Uh, we have to look into that. But I, 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 I don't think there is a particular clause saying that students will not get a student visa because they are eight, eight of 16 years of age. I hope that answers your question, Marianne. Um, does HEB have an education major? Not really. So, okay. Uh, and that is interesting because you said uh, you find something. So Hong Kong Baptist University is a government funded university. And just like other public university in Hong Kong, we all have um, a, a, a different arms, like a separate entity that offers self-finance program. So in that self-finance program, uh, institution, they offer education, but not within this. This, what we are offering here at this university is government funded program, and all the programs that we offer here is on this website. So no, not for now, we do not offer education major now. Um, can you give information about visa for international students? So I think I mentioned that earlier that we will assist the process. If you have further uh, questions, you can elaborate. I'm expected to graduate in 2024, but after which I will have to serve National Army in my country for two years. Mm. In that case, I suggest that you apply afterwards because we do not offer uh, deferred, we do not uh, give deferred offer. So welcome to come back and apply after two years. Is there a different scholarship acceptance rate for each admission round? more scholarship questions i'll go back to that question about accommodation i didn't realize that this is summer semester webinar do you know when mm, i'm not sure what so i'm not sure what this question is about this is not a summer semester webinar i don't know what is a summer west uh, semester webinar can you elaborate i'm not sure what it is about mm. Since there is no separate application for scholarship, should I ask the referees who will write me recommendation letter to endorse why I deserve the scholarship? So recommendation letters are not required. We do not have any guidelines on the quantity and the content. So you may want to discuss with your teachers about that. Um, but when it comes to scholarships, to, you know, students who want to have a scholarship, in terms of personal statement, I do have a tips. Um, because our scholarships are merit-based, they are not need based. So focusing on describing your challenges will not help. But when you are from a challenging background, you are you should focus on your strength. Like how you survive these challenges and still be extremely focused on what you want to do with your life. That is what you can focus on instead of focusing how miserable it is. Um, not because it's not miserable, but because this is not a need-based scholarship. So you may want to focus on strength, but not need, okay? 
Okay, many more questions about scholarship. We do not use Common App, just apply directly to HABU. This is not an American university, no. So just apply directly, directly to HABU using the link I shared in the chat just now. And it's also on our website. Okay, someone asked in the chat, can we use school ID? I don't know what that means. Good morning, Madam Pitts, do the offer pay do the offer paid internship in the school for first year undergraduate students. Well, we have students, in year one students doing, doing internship in their um, summer holiday after they finish their first year. It's possible. Uh, sometimes students get an internship by, re by you know, reference from their department. Sometimes they go to the Central Career Center. Sometimes they just, they, they just talk to someone like a professor so who re refer them to an internship. Sometimes they find out on their own. So, right. Uh, counselor, I would like to nominate students from my schools and Okay, so again, counselors, please contact us. If you have not received invitation from us, then you are not on our list and you may want to first start a conversation with us. Um, can we use our school ID instead of passport or national ID? No, you have to use either your national ID or passport because that's the official way to identify whether you are an international student. Okay, let's go to the question about scholarship. Indeed, I did not mention scholarship and that is a hot topic. So we have admission scholarship and it's also on our website. Let's go there together. So let's go there together. Well, when we talk about scholarship, I think you should also first look at the fees. Now, one thing I want to highlight, we are reviewing the tuition fee for 2023-24. The final amount will be announced hopefully soon in early December but it is subject to um, estimation, uh, uh, subject to review, okay? So before you look in, at the scholarship, please do look at the estimation uh, of fees and expenses, because what if you don't get a scholarship? What would happen? How much can you afford? What can you pay? Be realistic about it, okay? Because, I mean, I, I think all of you will understand this is a generous scholarship that we offer and the competition is horrible. It's, it's crazy. So please be realistic about this and look at the fees and expenses. After you have a good understanding of that, go to the scholarship page and you can look at the um, different kind of scholarship. So we do offer different kinds of admission scholarship to international students and competitive candidates will be considered automatically for different amount. So the top student, the top, top students, when I say top, um, they are outstanding academically. They have uh, given an outstanding interview performance. They are in every way brilliant non-academically and they demonstrate some um, really admirable personal attributes. All of those would be criteria. So we look at your score, we look at your personal attributes, your non-academic performance and your interview performance. And students could be uh, given a full scholarship, which is more than just 100% tuition, it's way more. So it also uh, include um, subsidy on living expenses that will also subsidize your accommodation on campus. And then there is the tuition waiver, which is 100% tuition scholarship. And then we also have half scholarships and some um, faculty also offer faculty level admission scholarships. Now, when it comes to the criteria, we set outstanding uh, academic performance. There is a baseline for a few popular international qualifications. For example, SAT, the baseline to be considered, like the starting point to be considered for a full scholarship is 1430. And for A level, a in three A-level subjects is the baseline, not including English. That would be the baseline. But it does not guarantee a word of scholarship. So that would be the starting point to be considered. If you do not have, for example, if you don't have three A's in three A-level subjects, then you will not be considered for a full scholarship, but you might be considered for a tuition waiver. That, that's how it goes. Uh, we don't have a score for every single qualifications that we offer. 
we that we accept because we do accept a very wide range of qualifications and we are happy i'm happy about it i'm really i'm really grateful about it because we do want to open our door to everybody so if you are studying in local qualifications i would say on average it should be at least 85 or above to be considered for any kind of scholarships if you don't then it's not entirely impossible, but it would be very challenging. And for those who are applying for creative arts degree, for example, acting, visual arts, music, film and TV, your portfolio, your audition, that will be very important in the evaluation process for, for sure. Okay, so I hope that answers some of your questions. Some Sometimes students come to me and say, um, I have IO 7.5, do I get a scholarship? No. It does not work that way. Uh, English proficiency requirement is a must, it's a default. If you have high score, that's great, but it will not get you a scholarship right away. It's a holistic approach when we look at a uh, scholarship award. So you don't get a scholarship just because you have 1430 in SAT or if you have eight in IELTS, it doesn't work that way. Um, what else? So scholarship, okay. And then some of you might have heard of the Bell and Rose Scholarship or you can read it on our website here. So the Bell and Rose Scholarship is a scholarship offered by the Hong Kong government. And each of the Hong Kong universities are invited to nominate students for that scholarship. And all those candidates will be competing against each other. So for us, we will nominate competitive students to compete for that scholarship. And that would be a tuition waiver. It's a 100% tuition uh, scholarship offered by the Hong Kong government. The major difference between the admission scholarship and the Bell and Rose scholarship is that for the admission scholarship, we will tell you whether you get a scholarship when we give you the offer because it's from the university. So we have the control. We will let you know. For example, if you have applied in the early round, if you are a very competitive candidate, you might get an offer with condition uh, for admission and scholarship at the same time by the end of December. But for the Bell and Rose Scholarship, even if we nominate you for the Bell and Rose Scholarship, which will start in February, the whole application process will start in February usually, you might not learn about the result until like July or even August. So uh, that could be quite a pain for many students because then you, you are not sure whether you have the money, uh, but that's how the government operate the Baron Rose Scholarship. So let's see if we still have any questions about scholarship after all this. Uh, I submit my application last week. I chose Arts and Tech. I think you might be a local student, so I will have to wait for you to, I would suggest that you write to whoever write to you, reply that message or simply write to AR direct at hab.edu.hk and ask about it. I don't want to go into individual application. If a scholarship receives a failed GPA, does she need to pay the tuition back to the university? Okay. So the admission scholarship is renewable subject to satisfactory uh, academic performance. So if someone get uh, an admission scholarship in their first year, they will have to get GPA 3.0 in their first year. If they fail to do so, their scholarship will not be renewed, but then they do not have to pay back the scholarship they receive in the first year, but then their scholarship will be terminated. Or there could be a review panel and they will look into the case and see if the student will be given a second chance. Uh, and if they do, uh, and if they fail again, whether the scholarship will be taken back. So that is, I think that what that is what it is. But if a student fail to complete a degree, then they will have to pay back the, the scholarship. So for example, if a student withdraw or fail to complete the degree, that is possible, but not because they fail the GPA only not not for once that's a very that's a very tricky question though but if you say if they fail the GPA do they have to pay back immediately that's a no okay admission confirmation fee so for 2023 is 
around 1200 US dollars. We are getting a confirmation on that for 2425. It would be similar around that price. And the final amount will be written in the offer letter. Um, when registration for accommodation starts, it usually starts in July for first year students to apply for accommodation. Okay, I think so with this one. I think I answered that question before about national service. You are advised to apply after you have complete your military service. Okay, I see a hand. I would suggest, uh, I don't know whether it's a real hand asking about, if it's about nomination scheme, if you are a counselor, I suggest that you write to us instead of um, is discussing it in this public webinar. Do we have any other questions from the students? If not, I think this is the time to close the deal. Um, Anu, if you are a counselor and if you want to uh, be in touch with us, please write to us, okay? And for those of you who have registered, we will send you the recording of this um, webinar. And I hope this helped. It's been a very long webinar, but thank you for your patience and good luck to all to your application to HBU or other university. Thank you. Goodbye.